Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of HDU Community Stories. This is a program as a part of HDYO that focuses on different perspectives, specifically within young people in the community impacted by HD, told by the experts themselves. And we're so excited to have three of our ambassadors with us today as we talk about the important topic of asking for help, which sometimes can be challenging, but uh, a really important part about this journey with everybody um, who's impacted by HD. So want to start off by introducing our panelists. So panelists, when I call your name, if you want to share a little bit about yourself, I'll start off with Gemma. First up, um, yeah, hi, I'm Gemma. Um, I am 28 um, and I'm from uh, the UK, um, currently live uh, just below Peterborough. Um, I tested positive for um, HD in 2022, um, so a couple of years ago now, um, after about just over a decade of, of being at risk. Um, and uh, I inherited um, HD from my mum, who is now um, end of life and in a care home. Um, and I looked after her at home um, for most of my childhood. Thanks so much for sharing that. Mackenzie. Hi, uh, I'm Mackenzie. I live in Niverville, Manitoba in Canada. Um, I am gene negative. I tested, it'll be five years ago in June. Um, my mom has HD um, and I've been involved in the Huntington's community basically since I can remember always volunteering um, at fundraisers or my parents just being involved. Um, I'm currently the youth coordinator for Manitoba and I'm also part of the uh, Huntington Society of Canada's mentorship program as a mentee and as a mentor. Amazing. Thank you, Mackenzie, for sharing that. And last but not least, Carly. Hi, uh, my name is Carly. I'm from Wales in the UK. Um, I tested positive HD in 2020, um, a year many of us want to forget for other reasons too. Um, I've known about HD all my life. Um, it's come from my dad's side of the family and it's just something I've always grown up around. Thank you all for sharing and, and for being here to have this conversation because it's really important for others to know your journey but then know the importance and, and what a difference it's made as well. Carly, I want to start by picking on you a little bit because you're in the process of getting your master's studying counseling and mental health needs. And I wanted to get your perspective being um, semi-professional as someone who's focusing their career on this topic. What is the importance from your perspective of seeking support, um, especially when it comes to professional support? I think in general, mental health support and asking for help is, is so, so significant. Um, but when it comes to navigating the world of HD, it, you know, things can be very isolated and lonely and it, it can feel very heavy. Um, so I think being impacted by HD more than ever, asking for help it, it is going to be so, so impactful. Um, there's obviously impacts to emotional well-being, whether it be just being impacted by HD and growing up in a family impacted by HD, being a young caregiver, and um, testing, going through the testing process, whether it be, you know, gene positive or negative. Um, I really can't emphasize enough the the importance of, of support and and just having the support around you. Um, so yeah, asking for help in my perspective is is a big, big thing, and that's why I'm pursuing this career because I know the necessity um, for that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And it's 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 amazing to see the difference, the different career choices that a lot of the young people are making because we have several ambassadors who are going into counseling and mental health professionals, several who are going in research, several who are helping others in many different ways. And I think it's one of those things of wanting to support others, knowing the struggles that you've gone through and making a difference. And so um, thanks thanks for, for doing that. Well, I wanted to open this up for discussion because while this is, uh, while this is a, a, re a recorded session, it's great to be able to share all of these different experiences because it's important to um, to show kind of the lineage of how you have developed as, as young leaders, but also have advocated for your own needs um, through seeking help. So 
Can you all share a little bit about when did you first reach out for help and what were some of the circumstances for the reasons why? What, why did you, um, what, were, what was happening at home? What was happening in your own lives that made you really start to reach out for help? Um, Mackenzie, I'm gonna pick on you first if you don't mind. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in my early teens, my mom and dad told uh, me and my sister that um, my mom was HD positive and growing up seeing my aunt in the late stages, um, I kind of knew what the end looked like, but didn't really know what the journey would look like getting there. Um, so when I found out, it was very kind of isolating and feeling very alone because nobody in that I know for school or anything in my life really knew what Huntington's was besides the people um, in my immediate family. So um, it was very like feeling alone and kind of unsure about who to talk to and um, like for other people to kind of understand what I was going through. Um, and so then in 2014, the Huntington Society did a conference in Winnipeg. So nice and local. My parents decided, well, let's go do that and kind of see what's going on. Um, and that was the first time they did a YPAD day. So young people affected by Huntington's disease. Um, it's a chapter in, uh, in Canada for young people that are struggling with um, HD and anything else really going on. And so uh, we decided, well, let's, let's go take a look at that. And from that point on, like it was amazing to see just so many other people that um, kind of the same feeling of being isolated and alone mm -hmm. kind of growing up with no one else knowing really what we're going through and that kind of changed because I was able to relate with other people and find other resources to get help and kind of found a new support system to talk to about the issues and I wouldn't have to explain what Huntington's was. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it sounds like really from the get-go, your family was really supportive and, and looked for new ways specifically within the HD community. Yeah, for sure. And I think for my parents, it was, um, they'd seen kind of my aunt and my cousins, how that kind of affected my cousins. So I think it was basically, they wanted to make sure we had the option for support that we needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gemma. So I think um, for me, the first time that I reached out for support was um, uh, a couple of years after my mum's diagnosis. So my mum was diagnosed when I was about 14. I think it was probably when I was about 16 that I first reached out to the um, Huntington's Disease uh, Association um, here in the UK. Um, and they put me in touch with our local um, advisor. Um, and that was the first time that I'd sort of um, really sought help from a, um, an organisation. Didn't even really know that they existed, um, to be honest, um, because I, I had quite a complex um, family situation at the time um, and um, nobody in, in, in my life um, other than immediate family and um, medical professionals actually knew um, that my mum had Huntington's disease. Um, and I had been asked to um, not to talk about it and not to tell people about her diagnosis. So for me, it was it was really significant. Um, it was the first time that I'd actually reached out and spoken to anybody about it. Um, and it was um, it was quite a liberating, quite a liberating feeling. Um, that first phone call um, with our advisor, um, and she was fantastic. And at the the rig pup partially the reason that I did um, originally get in contact with them was that mum's behaviour was extremely challenging. Um, and we had uh, a neurologist at the time who really didn't know a lot about HD. Um, and she was on quite a, a very limited, um, he had a very limited range of medications that he, he felt confident in prescribing her. And we had reached the point where mum's mental health and her behaviours had become quite dangerous, actually. Um, and it was really, really challenging. So that was the point at which I thought we really, really need some help here because um, we can't go on like this. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like that was very specific to kind of being a, a, your caregiver role is that and trying to figure that out. And I think that's one thing that sometimes people don't always realize outside the community is that most young people at one time or another um, who are directly impacted or at risk for Huntington's disease have a huge 
caregiver role, whether it's primary caregiver or as a support caregiver. And if you're living in the same home, I mean, you, you see the changes that HD can have. And it sounds like that was a big one that, that they were able to help out with. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were fantastic. Um, and without them, you know, if, if they hadn't got involved at that point and, and kind of stepped in and, and organized for us to see um, a different uh, neurologist who was, who was um, uh, kind of specialized in, in Huntington's disease, mm -hmm. um, I really don't know what we would have done um, because we, yeah, we had kind of reached, um, reach, reach the end of what, um, what, the yeah what our other neurologist was 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 able mm -hmm. to do so um yes i'm incredibly grateful to them and just to be able to talk to another person another human being who really got it at a time when nobody in my life knew about my mum's diagnosis or my caregiving responsibilities or my genetic at risk status was just incredible um it was just the best feeling to be able to openly talk about it um and to feel safe in doing that mm -hmm. uh, safety and strangers where you didn't feel like you had to have any kind of air about you you were just able to tell the issues and and know that they weren't going to judge you or have an opinion it was just more about how can I help myself how can I help my family and, and having that be an open relationship yeah Carly um, going off kind of what Gemma just said then in regards to how kind of liberating it is to kind of ask for help and, and have that, but also just having someone who got it. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily feel like I needed to ask for help until I tested. Um, maybe it was just something that I just was going along with, but then I really felt the impact following genetic testing. Um, so following that, because I, I didn't really have the best um, follow-up kind of support, I, I did really, unfortunately, struggle quite a bit um, for a few months. So I, I kind of realised that, OK, something needs to, to be done now, obviously, seeing changes in the family member um, whilst having that knowledge of the result kind of, you know, had a change in my emotional well-being. So, you know, I'm not afraid to acknowledge or, or say that and it's one of the main reasons I'm doing kind of my career because I know how far I've come and how I know I'm not going to be the only one mm -hmm. you know most people who are impacted by HD chances are they are going through the exact same feelings as you if you're feeling that way someone else in the community is going to be feeling that way so reaching out and, and asking for support from someone who does really get it is is so impactful you know connecting with those who are going through the same thing because that really really did help me and I think just that impact of acknowledging you know it's okay you know it's gonna enhance your resilience and you know reduce the burden that you feel as well because I think most people struggle to ask for help because of that feeling of being a burden um you know I know I felt that way and, and the vulnerability feeling it, it's massive so you know you don't want to feel like a burden to your family because they're experiencing and going through you know the world of HD you know you don't want to speak to other people because they're experiencing similar things as well and they may you know not want to to deal with it but actually everyone wants to support you and you deserve support and you know, asking and seeking for for help is is so important and so significant. Yeah, well said. I'm curious, and and you mentioned the burden, and this kind of leads into the next point I wanted to chat about is, did you did any of you think about seeking help before and stop? Gemma, you're you're nodding. What? Why did you stop? What made you not actually go through with it? I think um, for me, it was pressure um, from stigma, um, stigma surrounding HD, pressure from my family just being absolutely, uh, I say my family, my immediate family, um, uh, my parents being absolutely terrified to, uh, absolutely completely terrified um, 
to tell people about it and I think I I really believed that that something something awful would happen um if I did reach out for help um and I did tell people about it because I really internalized that belief that it, it was this awful thing and we were kind of um cursed as a family um and I wanted to reach out for support I wasn't really sure um what was out there um and I couldn't really allow myself to speak about it for a long time until things got really really desperate mm -hmm. so I think that's probably why I held off um in that situation for longer than than was ideal mm -hmm. Mackenzie you're kind of acknowledging similar things uh, yeah, I think um, for me, it was just not knowing, like you said, kind of what was out there for resources. Um, like, for example, my mom growing up, there weren't these programs for youth who were, you know, going through this. Um, so she didn't have any experience with that to kind of like, oh, say, oh, there might be these resources. out. Um, at the time, there wasn't anything um, extensive on supporting youth. It was more so supporting caregivers and like husbands wives um who have someone they love with hds um i i definitely knew i needed the the support but i just didn't know where to look for it mm -hmm. yeah so we talked a little bit about some of the fears when you first reach out for to kind of to reach out so Gemma, i'm going to pick on you just from this particular instance for you had some of the fear of being a cursed family and some of the stigmas that you had internally, did those fears come true? Or what was that experience like whenever, um, if they didn't come true? No, they have never come true, um, ever. And uh, <laughs> really, really grateful for that. I think for me, my, my that first experience was so positive and so supportive. Um, and it was another year before I first spoke about Huntington's disease um, to people who were external to our um, family um, and external to the um, HDA. Um, so it did take another year before I got to that point before I first mentioned it again. Um, but yes, that from that first experience, um, even though there has been some judgment at times and and people have sometimes made remarks um, and maybe people don't always say the best things, maybe they mean well, but they, they don't always come out well when they're, when you're telling them about Huntington's disease. Ultimately, those, those fears that something would awful, awful would happen to our family never did come true. And all I've experienced when I tell people is love and compassion um even if they don't fully understand um the genetics behind it or if they've never seen anyone with the disease um people do want to to empathize um and to try to understand so yes those fears have never um come true for me carly what were some of your fears when you first reached out for help because i know that it was um, under your testing circumstances and and it took a little bit for you to do to to reach out for help what were some of those fears that you had I think um kind of the stigma in society for one regarding HD like there's been a lot of kind of instances that I've been I've been there to see in regards to my dad um and the lack of kind of education and knowledge because Although everyone I've seen, um, any kind of psychotherapist, anyone I've seen has been so empathetic and, you know, really listened. It, it can be hard sometimes when they don't fully know the impact of HD as such or, or what, you know, what it is. And sometimes they can not pretend, but sometimes they can kind of, say the wrong things but not meaning to because they don't have the full kind of knowledge um so that can be a little difficult at times um which is exactly why another reason why i've you know pursued a career because i want to be able to have that first-hand understanding for for others in general but 
yeah, it's it's still very impactful. Um, but it's it's a lot better if, if someone does kind of really get it and understand it because they can understand why you're feeling the way you're feeling then mm-hmm. and validate that, you know. So we've mentioned stigmas. So some of the stigmas are personal stigmas that probably kind of come from your own family environment or your home environment where there's the fear of reaching out because your family might be outed for lack of better terms um, of being impacted by HD. I'm talking about stigmas because of the lack of knowledge of of professionals or others in general with the awareness of HD. What are some other stigmas that that you've noticed or have been scared of or that you've heard from other people in the community when it comes to HD? I think um, the stigma around mental health in general is a big one because Mm -hmm. that feeling that you're having and that you shouldn't ask for help, you should carry this heavy, Mm -hmm. just carry it all on your own because you can deal with it on your own and you are resilient and you are strong. And I can guarantee every single young person in in the HD community are resilient and are strong, but because they've had to be, um, they've had no choice with regards to everything that they've had to deal with. So they deserve the support um, and you deserve to to have a kind of better path. And you're going to be able to move forward better by you know, asking for help, but it it can be hard to move past the stigmas around talking about your mental health as well because of judgments and and things like that, you know. So like the stigma may be of weakness if you ask for help when when really it's an enhanced strength to have a support system is to kind of summarize that. You can what are some other yeah. sorry. <laughs> you no, can no, reduce... the because obviously it's such an overwhelming feeling sometimes being impacted by HD. There's so many things that come up emotionally and, and stuff. So you can you risk burning yourself out really. And you're then not going to be in a in a great way to to support your loved ones with HD, but also support yourself um, and be able to navigate the world better. But resiliency and strength is, is going to come with that. Yeah. Other stigmas. I think just um, like you were saying, there's already the stigma around mental health. And even for like, as a male, like kind of growing up, most men are like, oh, I have to be strong and kind of not show weakness. So um, having need to reach out even just for mental health, it's, you know, it's kind of hard to do that because everyone else seems to be able to deal with it. But when inside they're they're just kind of holding it in so kind of like that false um false thought about what really like is going on in people's lives we're all kind of hiding the pain that we're in so it just makes it harder to reach out for support if you feel like other people don't need that support um you kind of feel weak and like you're not uh strong enough even though you said like we are some very strong people in this community as we go through so much definitely and you know asking for support and asking for help is the first step to get in it so it's kind of the the biggest kind of jump before that you know I think appearance can be deceiving so to use Mackenzie that example even if you see other people in the HD community who seem to have it all together you know (laughs) in comparison to what you're feeling you don't know what they're feeling and you don't know um, the different challenges that they're going to. And so I think it's just human nature to want to compare yourself to others to say, well, they're doing they're doing this way or perceived this way. How come I don't feel like that, how I think that they feel? And that can really get you in a triggering spot because you never know what's happening. There's this pressure then as well um, that you kind of put on yourself because of that when everyone's their own person. Does the outside stigma of physical symptoms as a caregiver, is that does that come into play at all with not wanting to seek help because it's very out there with how people, whether it's behavior or career? I'd say yeah, I think- so. Oh, sorry, Carly. No, go on. You, <laughs> you go first. <laughs> no, I just, I'd say so, yes, because, I, you know, I have 
experienced some negative kind of situations and it it does make you feel frustrated and angry in a way but it it puts you backwards to to one in to seek that support you know because like a bit exposed yeah and it's kind of exposed judged and then that vulnerability is is quite overwhelming isn't it Gemma? Yeah, I would I would completely, completely shadow that, Carly. And I think um that there have been many times um where I felt quite self-conscious and and aware that that, that, that maybe people a lot of people are watching my mum's behaviours, um, but watching us and not particularly understanding um what's going on because they don't have a lot of, of context and sometimes that that could make me feel quite um quite self-conscious about um being open and uh and, and honest um with people and, and asking for help um and yeah I think that can sometimes sometimes shut that down lots of like assumptions about my mom being drunk as well um which is always tricky to it when when people come up to you when you're in a pub and you're 16 years old um and they say you know would make comments um to my mom for example saying um it's a bit early in the day to been drinking um if she just had a fall or tripped over her feet um or um think you've had one too many um a little bit early for it being lunchtime and it's those kind of comments don't don't open up um they just make you angry they don't they don't open up the kind of um they don't encourage you to seek support um so yes yeah, sometimes that can be tough mm -hmm. what surprised you after the first time you sought out for help um well, to be to be honest, for me, it, it's not the biggest positive. Unfortunately, it was the kind of lack of support that was there. Um, kind of trying to figure out where to go and where to turn. So that that did surprise me because I did kind of expect and think that there would be more. It wasn't until I got involved and in touch with HDO that I kind of felt that support was there you know but that was a good few months after testing and me trying to to get that um but also the positive side of that is all these other people around the world in path of hd you've you really aren't on your own um and that was a big thing for me because i i like mackenzie said i've only ever acknowledged it in in my own family I didn't know anyone outside of my family that had HD or knew about it. Um, so, yeah, that surprised me, the, the amount of people that are actually impacted by HD. Well, it took a lot of strength on your part because it's easy when you feel disappointed in something, especially when you're reaching out for mental wellness support, to hit a kind of a blockade or disappointment and then to keep going and finding new support services that took a lot of strength Carly to do that because it's very easy to stop after like after an obstacle especially the first time yeah and on that note I'd really 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 push for anyone trying to get help that may find a little block along the way to not give up because mm -hmm. that really isn't going to to get any better um Sadly, there might be blocks along the way, but there is a lot more support now than there was. Um, but that's why I have this drive and determination to to do what I want to do, because I know how I've kind of had to, to navigate and cope with everything. I have friends, um, you know, many friends, many ambassadors that also feel the same, and I want them to have the support that they should. And I really feel strongly about that. So... Yeah, I guess that the strength and resilience is there, but it's because I, yeah, I kind of have to. I don't, I don't want that to be the case for anyone else anymore. You know. Other surprises after the first time you sought help or support. 
Um, I think I kind of almost had a little bit of the opposite um, experience as Carly, where um, I kind of going into it wasn't expecting there to be much out there or like very little support for young people and didn't really expect anyone else um, kind of closer to my age to be going through the same thing. So then kind of walking into my first youth event, I was like, wow, like there's actually like legit other people. And um, at the time they were just a brand new program, basically the mentorship program in Canada and never thought there'd be something like that. So there's uh, mentors that get matched with mentees and then they help support you through um, whatever's going on, whether it's HD or even just regular life. Um, mm -hmm. So that was like a happy surprise to know that there's something out there like that. And um, it was such like a positive resource for me. I felt like it was a little easier to bear the burden of living with a mom who was sick and dealing with Huntington. Well, I think it's interesting when you introduce yourself, you said that you're a mentee and a mentor. And I think that that shows the duality of just being there to support one another and the community as a peer support person is that oftentimes there are times you need to ask for help and then times you can help others. And I think whether or not you realize it, everybody does it. Um, and so I think that that's, that's a really important thing too. Gemma, what surprised you? I would say that I had a very similar experience to Carly um, and so I can relate to a lot of what you said in terms of the lack of um, support for for young people um, because I mean back when I first reached out obviously the the Huntington's Disease Association do have youth workers and a whole um, you know a whole a whole team of um, and, and youth groups and um, which is absolutely fantastic um, they have all of that now. Um, but back when I reached out um, 12, 13 years ago, there, was, there wasn't any of that. Um, and so they were absolutely fantastic at helping with my mum and, and, and as a consequence did positively improve my life as well, um, very significantly by helping with that. Um, but I was very conscious that there was no um, uh, kind of like youth support groups or um there was no kind of way for me to connect with other young people who are in a similar situation to me um after a couple of years there were support groups um but they weren't for young people um and sometimes i think you really need um to talk to other people who are in uh, a similar situation to you um and so i i never really got to speak to anyone else who had um who was at risk um or who had tested um or had a parent with um Huntington's disease for a long long time um which I think is a shame because I think that could have really really if those youth services were um in my area back then then I think it would have made the world of difference and um yeah if I'd had um the HDYO back then it would have been a a, a massive game changer mm -hmm. Well, I think for people who are watching this, there are a variety of, of places where those services aren't available. Um, and just to know that you can reach out to HDYO uh, for any of that support and just finding a, a home, because um, there is a lot of discrepancy, even in countries that have seem to have a lot of support, you do have a lot of deserts out there where you don't have anything local. So um, always know that you can reach out. Well, let's provide some some tools and some resources for people who are watching this and, and maybe get inspired or even people who have sought out help but just maybe are, are interested in hearing more. What are some practical tips that you'd give to people in this community about seeking help? Um, I can start off. Um, so I'd say a good tip is to reach out to um, your local Huntington's organization, and then also go on the HDYO website um, and see all the resources. Reach out to HDYO if you want some more information um, because it's hard to um, want to get help if we don't know what's out there. Um, and if you do your own research, there might be programs or stuff you might miss. Um, I just recommend maybe reaching out because um, they have information you might not uh, even know you could use. Um, like in the Huntington Society of Canada, um, 
at first going to a conference, I didn't expect that there would be the mentorship program and they had a session on that. And then that made me want to get in there. So learning more about what's out there really um, helps you figure out what support you might need or support you can try. Mm -hmm. I think I'd probably echo that to, in the sense that like obviously not everyone does have their local HD, you know, so HDYO, definitely the resources online um, and you can reach out to, you know, even an ambassador, for example, who may have experienced um, a similar experience to you and that's, you know, an option. But it also a big practical tip for me is finding something that gives me a little bit of an escape also from HD. So, you know, finding something that you find fun and positive and does impact you and make you feel more positive is, is definitely a big thing. Um, it kind of gives me that other avenue as well as then, because if people do their own research online, I, I don't know if you two would agree, but there can be some quite frightening things you may come across. Um, I know I did when I was kind of younger and, and did that. So I think HDYO website definitely has all the right resources and, and people you can reach out to. If you do have a local place, then yeah, the HDA are, are brilliant. But yeah, also finding things that you find enjoyable in life. Mm -hmm. I think too, it's important to realize that um, it's a spectrum, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, you have to start slow as you're asking for help. It's very, it's, you're not going to just jump at first and dive right into this and find the right match, just like Carly said, and, and Gemma said, everybody said, it was kind of figuring out what you needed and what support you needed. And, um, and it can be really hard to make that first step. So even things like following social media um, with HD associations, that's something that you can do internationally and you can figure out, you can meet others through their stories and shared experiences that can maybe help pave the way for you to one, obtain that information, but then two, feel comfortable enough to reach out because of these shared experiences. And that is also a way of getting help. Um, and when you're ready, as you're following from the safety of your uh, an arm's length away, literally from the safety of, of your home or wherever you're, you are, and you have that barrier of that screen, you're still able to get engaged and, and to, to find a lot of that support. So I'm curious, what kind of support do you all think is 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 the most helpful for you that you appreciate just for yourself again and it's a very personal journey um oh. my probably would would be um having kind of therapy um I think mm -hmm. it's it's also very impactful to have someone with a kind of outside perspective that can just sit and listen and make you feel heard and even if they can't fully walk in your shoes or understand what you're going through they really make you feel heard and acknowledged and that what you're feeling is valid mm -hmm. and yeah I think that's one of the big things but then also one of the, the most impactful thing is is reaching out to um, a friend in part of a HD mm -hmm. you know sending someone a message just to say you know I'm having a bit of a tough day how are you doing um just check just checking in as well you know mm -hmm. so I think that that's great because every everyone's going through the sim similar thing and mm -hmm. you're not on your own with what you're feeling so by just you know chatting to someone who is experiencing a similar thing can just really make you think right I'm I'm not on my own here this is okay mm -hmm. I'm allowed to feel this way for now. It's not going to last forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of echo a little bit of what you're saying. Um, like I use my family, my immediate family. We help support each other, but it's nice to have someone outside of the situation um, that still understands kind of what's going on because they're a part of the HD community. Because um, then it, 
if there you have some issues with kind of going on between the family or not kind of using the family to help support like you can have an outside opinion or a different idea from their experience and not just kind of what's going on in your personal group yeah I think that's a really good point um and I'm also a massive advocate for therapy and and having some kind of independent um voice that can that can impartially um help you through it in a very non-judgmental way um and that has been incredibly important for me too um and i sort of wish um in hindsight um with my mental health i wish that i had um reached out for help a little bit sooner rather than rather than later it's a lot easier to reach out for help and um and sort of action that when you're not in a really really dark um when you're not in a dark place um and it's really useful to kind of forge those connections um and to kind of um start to build that understanding of your um your emotions prior to things getting bad um because then you know where to go um if you do have a bad day rather than if you're already feeling awful then having the additional hurdle of 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 reaching out for the first time and it all being very very fresh and just something else that you have to to worry about and do that day um so yes I, I do wish um in hindsight that I had kind of maybe made those connect I'd felt able to make those connections and and reach out um a little bit sooner than maybe I did because I think that would have been really really helpful for me um but yeah definitely I think that's a really interesting point is that usually when you acknowledge that you need support and help, you've kind of gone past that spectrum of preventative help. And even just before you think maybe you need to reach out, maybe taking a step back and saying, maybe it would be good to talk with someone just to see or just to know who I could turn to if I was having such a, an experience where I needed to reach out that kind of preventative aspect of mental support, I think is a really important thing too. It's good to have it there when you need it. Um, mm -hmm. I completely get what Gemma says. If, if it's gone too far, it can be a lot harder to be able to ask for help. The, the overwhelming feeling is probably too much. And yeah, so I think the, the earlier the better really. Mm -hmm. And I think talked a little. Um, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Jenna. <laughs> so, so we need to talk about you, Jenna. Um, and there's, I think there is a whole science base, um, or so my therapist tells me, um, behind the fact that when you're in a in a regulated state, your brain is is more able to um, to make decisions and think with more um, logic and weigh things up and um, it's a lot harder to, to kind of do that once your um, emotional reasoning is kind of clouded mm -hmm. um, by being, you know, quite badly dysregulated emotionally. So, um, yeah, I think it's uh, sometimes reaching out for help earlier um, and not kind of waiting until you're in a crisis um, can be really, really beneficial. But obviously it's not it's not always possible. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, if you can, then. Um, it does sort of help to prepare you. Absolutely. I was going to say, we talked a little bit about family and friends, and some of you have family that have been uh, supportive of you seeking out help outside beforehand. But I think it's been mentioned a, a few times about some of the things that um, people can say with the best of intentions, but it ends up making you maybe feel more burdened or um, embarrassed or worried. So what would you say to loved ones who maybe aren't directly impacted by HD, but want to support you? What would you say would be some tips for them for how they can provide that support without accidentally making it feel worse for the person they're trying to support? Just be in a listening ear rather than trying to tell them <laughs> um it's your kind of journey and it's your story and it's your life and the navigation of a life impacted by hd is is 
so big that sometimes it can just be so heavy so just having that listening ear rather than someone saying you should do this or pretending they mm. might know um is the biggest thing just having someone there acknowledging that it's okay that you're feeling this way and it's not always going to to be this hard yeah to build on that a little bit um it's like you need someone there to listen not to fix what's going on um you kind of just need the support like i have friends who i start talking to them about it and i call like how can i make this better it's it's not about making it better it's just giving me an outlet to get it out because that makes me feel better it less all my chest i'm not holding it in and letting it kind of build up and get worse mm -hmm. um and even uh if they're like oh how can i help maybe it's even just asking them if you haven't heard from me in a couple weeks or a month maybe just reach out to see if i'm doing okay mm -hmm. um so it's not just you always reaching out when you need help. There's people checking in on you and it also makes you feel better a little bit about um, sharing because it's not you just feeling like you're burdening someone. They're actually asking to help in that sense. I completely echo that. Like that's massive, like them being there for you rather than you constantly because it's just going to emphasize um, the burdensome feeling you have. So to to not consistently like every day how you do when as if it's going to be a constant thing but like he, like um, Mackenzie said it's you know a week or two if you haven't heard from me then just check in how you're doing you know and then you can just have that listening you yeah I'd agree with that I think when people reach out to you even if it's just for a general chat about um, you know life what's on tv um sometimes it it that is a that's one of the kind of the best forms of um of support because if you are feeling if you're if, if you don't feel like you can reach out if you do feel like you're a burden um you are burdening other people having somebody just drop call you um and just show you that they are interested in in how you're feeling is 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 really really nice um yeah definitely think that's great and the other thing that i would um say i guess uh, experienced a bit of unfortunately as i'm sure we all have but obviously the genetics of of hd kind of comes into play um and many of us will um be at risk of of hd or have already tested um and i think trying to if if you're not familiar with huntington's disease um even if you are um best to stay off the subject of of genetic testing or trying to pressurize someone to get tested or if somebody's struggling um don't try to kind of convince them one way or the other whether you do or don't think they should get tested um because that's that is something that's a very personal decision um to that person it's very individual um and in making insinuations of how you think they should deal with that um, situation um, is something that that is isn't going to be helpful to them at that time. I completely agree with that, and I just think one of the biggest things is allowing the person impacted by HD to just feel huge, but also that their feelings are normal and. It's not going to be forever, but it's okay to feel the way you're feeling right now. And having that other person to say it's okay to feel the way you're feeling is, is such a massive thing too, because I don't know about anyone else, but I've a lot of the time felt like I shouldn't be feeling this way. Having that person to say it's normal for what you're having to deal with in life. It's okay to feel like this sometimes and it's not going to be forever, I think is a big, a big thing too. Sometimes I need to hear that reminder. Um, their thoughts, not, not you know, you, you don't need. They're just thoughts, um, mm. and you're not going mad. Sometimes that's a really, really helpful statement for me to hear because at times I feel like I do. I feel like I'm just. I feel like I am going mad. Um, so yeah, um, for me too, just someone to just sit sit with you and and just remind you that what you're feeling is completely is completely normal and it's okay 
um, and the thoughts that you're having aren't aren't ridiculous um, is is really really helpful. I think that there's just so many good intentions out there when people do ask how people are doing and. One of the things I was thinking as well is that depending on what stage you are being impacted by HD, you might be in a stage where you're very actively caring for someone. And one of the things that um, we would counsel people on is make a list of things. You're thinking of like really tangible things that you could use help for too. Um, you know, kind of bringing it back to, to that caregiver role. So when people do ask, how can I help? You can say, well, could you go pick up some laundry detergent? Like, here are the things that I really need help with because people do want to help. There's that kind of that support as a friend, especially as you're a young caregiver, but think of some things too that other people could do. Could you take care of the yard? Could you go get the, you know, whatever that might look like, um, because then people can have a physical way of helping, again, depending on the stages that you're in. But um, I think it's also important for you to be able to advocate for the help that you actually need from your friends and from outside family members to be able to say, like, right now, this is what's helpful for me. Um, it's not helpful for you to ask me so many questions at this time. It's helpful for you to just listen. And I think that that's okay too. Yeah, it's good to acknowledge what you need, even just sit back and be like, what do I need from someone right now is, mm -hmm. is, is a beneficial thing because they can do something, even if it is just sit there and listen, you know? Mm -hmm. So pieces of advice for those who are maybe teetering on that first step of seeking support, what would you say to them? Um, I think if if you're feeling you need support uh, and you kind of don't reach out, you're kind of staying at this rock bottom. And the longer you kind of push it off and knowing you need help, the longer you're going to be at that rock bottom. And it might be like scary and like not knowing if the support's going to help. But if you don't use it, you're going to stay here. But if you use the resources or find resources, it can only have a positive impact and help you kind of feel better at a certain point. Yeah, yeah I think, I think um, oh, oh, sorry, I was <laughs> just going to say, oh, yeah, it's that <laughs> thing of if you don't try, you never know. Yeah, I think echoing both of them there is like, I think reach out is one of the main, probably biggest things, even if it's just the HDO first and foremost, you know, see, you know, seeking therapy or seeking outside support is too overwhelming right now and is too too much even just reaching out to someone from the you know hdyo community reaching out to you jenna reaching out to just someone i think is a good first step because it allows you to realize you're not alone um, and once you realize you're not alone it it does kind of help you feel like you can then further that support, you know, and, and seek help. It, it's, yeah. a scary first step. it's a scary first step, but um, once you kind of take it, like you don't realize how many doors are open for different supports or even being more involved in like, even if you don't feel like you need support, but you're like, I want to be more involved. This is still the step you can take because reaching out lets you know what's out there and what ways you can support others or be involved like it's up to you how much you are involved in the community and it's not always just about being supported but if you want to help others there are ways to do that out there and like you said you know it, it's a spectrum and people need help in different ways like not everyone may be struggling with the same thing and someone might need support being a young caregiver but then someone might need support because they're worried about you know the genetic testing or their genetic risk there, there's so many different things so I think that baby steps and just reaching out to even to one person or, or one organization is is really helpful yeah I think um it if those if it all seems like it's too overwhelming at the moment and it just seems massive and you don't really know where to start um, she said, Jenna, could just be the, the, the tiniest step, just thinking of, of one thing that you can do today that sets you sets you off on the right path. It doesn't have to be a huge 
a huge thing. It can be a tiny, tiny thing, whatever you can manage that day. But if you keep making those tiny, tiny steps every day, then um, eventually it does become a, a massive leap. But you don't have to make that leap all at once and have it be completely overwhelming. You know, you can start small. I think it's important to know that your your need is going to change. You may need a lot of support at, at this one stage, and then it may taper off a little bit, and then it comes back, and that's that is expected because life is happening, and HD can kind of impact different stages at different times for individuals at a at a time when it's not as felt, but then come back and smack you in the face. And so I think that's when having your team of support networks put together. So then that way, as you need them, you can really reach out or is it more of a maintenance, you know? And so just to understand that there, it ebbs and flows a lot for that support that you need. And we've, we've been adjusting a little bit about how we're, how we've been talking about reaching out to HDYO, because I think there is it's it gets sometimes scary if you're it can be scary if you're having to reach out to an individual person and put yourself really out there so we've been saying we're only an email away because there's a little bit of anonymity still with sending an email so it's a very easy way to start in and then hosting a meeting in person but just even that first email of saying like here i am this is what i'm experiencing and then let that individual, let HUIO, let whomever you're reaching out to then pull you in a little bit more. And so you can really manage that comfortability level of how 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 fast you're getting that support and what those steps look like. Yeah, and I think reducing well, the burden is is massive with that, isn't it? Like just doing that reduces so much of the burden some feeling you have because you've done that, you've made that first step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important that what other people do doesn't necessarily mean it's right for you. And that's, you know, that's a little bit of the antithesis of our ambassador program, because it's a great first way to get a little bit involved. But there are so many ambassadors who aren't out there for the public to see, but they're on the back end, they're sharing their story um, privately within the group or providing feedback or support in so many different ways, but they're doing it in a way that's comfortable for them. And then they have individuals like you who are out there and sharing your story, but then there are times that you all don't feel comfortable doing that either, which is totally fine because you know, you all need to be the driver of your experiences and, and you're wanting to help support others and, and, you know, support and help doesn't just have to be going into a clinic or going into a therapist's office. It is leaning on one another as well. Completely, I think well, that's so impactful. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all so much for your time today and vulnerability and, and sharing your thoughts and your experiences because it really does make a, a huge difference to the community. And as we've shared a few times, if you are in need, want to know what resources are out there, or just want someone to talk to, please do reach out to HDYO. Um, we are all here to support you. And as you can see, you do have a family of people around you who are who are here to help. Um, but thank you all so much. And, and this is another great edition of HDU Community Stories. Take care and have a great day.